Turn with me, if you will, to Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4. It's interesting that Nikos uh, and Debbie, you chose the, the songs you did today. You know, the, in this coming week and next Sunday, the world will be celebrating what it calls Easter. That's not a Christian festival. It celebrates, purports to celebrate something that's Christian, but it's not in itself a Christian festival. We celebrate the fulfilment of what Jesus fulfilled, the Passover. And that is on the 14th of this week. But we're celebrating it all the same. Jesus Christ, Saviour, Deliverer, King of Kings, Lord of Lords, paid the price for our sin. All glory to his name. Hallelujah. Mark chapter 4, sorry, Matthew chapter 4. Same initial, different book. Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 to 11. (coughs) I'm going to read two sets of scriptures today, but... You'll see as we go through that they are connected. Matthew 4 verse 1 Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted forty days and forty nights, he was afterwards hungry. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And the devil taketh him up into a holy city, into the holy city, sorry, and setteth him on the pinnacle of the temple, and said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest thee at any time thou shalt dash thy foot against a stone. And Jesus said unto him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Again the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain, and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world, and the glory of them. And said unto him, All these things will I give thee, if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Then said Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Then the devil leaveth him, and behold, angels came and ministered to him. Now turn to Matthew chapter 26, if you will. Verses 36 to 45. Matthew 26 Verse 36 to 45. Then cometh Jesus with them unto a place called Gethsemane, and said unto the disciples, Sit ye here while I go and pray yonder. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. Then said he unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful, even unto death. Tarry ye here. And watch with me. He went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Not as I will, but as thou wilt. And he cometh unto the disciples and findeth them asleep and said unto Peter, What? Could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away again the second time and prayed, saying, O my Father, if this cup may not pass away from me, except I drink it, thy will be done. And he came and found them sleep again, for their eyes were heavy. And he left them and went away again and prayed the third time, saying the same words. Then cometh his disciples, cometh to his disciples, sorry, Sleep now and take your rest. Behold, the hour is at hand, 
and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hand of sinners. Rise, let us be going. Behold, he is at hand that doth betray me. Two different passages of scripture today. But I've read these two because I believe the Lord wants us to really understand something that's tremendous today. Something really tremendous. And if this doesn't knock your socks off, I don't know what will. If it doesn't bless you, I don't know what will. So let's continue. You know, I'm not blowing my own trumpet here. This is not because of how I'm saying this that it's going to bless you. It's what I'm saying is going to bless you. Let's continue. You know, I, I find it really amazing that throughout the Bible, the phrase, the Son of God, is used some 47 times in those specific words, Son of God. It's used from some 47 times. And yet the phrase, Son of Man, is used some 205. 205. Now you may begin to see, if you remember what I've read, why I read those two different sets of scriptures. One acknowledges Jesus as the Son of God. The other, Jesus himself, as the Son of Man. And that's why I've called this message, Son of God, Son of Man. And I hope you'll be encouraged and blessed as we go through this. Number first of all, I want to look at the testings. The testings that Jesus had to endure. In our first passage of scripture, we read that Jesus was tempted, tested, enticed by the devil, to try and use both his divine power and his divine authority for his own benefit. Did you notice that? He tried to get Jesus to use his divine power and his divine authority as the Son of God for his own benefit. His very allegiance to God was questioned. And wasn't that how God tested Adam and Eve? Did God say, you can be like God. You can be God's. In verse 3 and in verse 6, Jesus is addressed by the devil as the Son of God. In both those verses, he is addressed as the Son of God by the devil. And in verse 9, the devil, as the God of this world and its system, little g, challenges Jesus to switch allegiance to him. And not to his Father God, the creator of all things. He challenges Jesus to change allegiance. Jesus is the Son of God. We all agreed on that. Jesus came as the Son of God. The only begotten of the Father. And John's Gospel makes it so clear. Right through John's Gospel. In fact, that's why it was written. To react against those who were saying, well, Jesus was, there was just a spirit that came on a man and the spirit left before the crucifixion. All those things, all those type of things were around, all those false doctrines were around at that time. And John wrote this gospel to say, Jesus is the Son of God. And he could prove it from the Old Testament scriptures. By his fulfilment of the prophecies and by the things that he did and the way that he acted with people. Jesus is the Son of God. There's no doubt, is there? That he is the Son of the living God. However, in Luke's account of uh, what we read in, in Matthew 4, we read this. Luke 4, verse 13. And when the devil had ended all the temptations... He departed from him for a season. For a season. 
He departed from him for a season. And that's an addition to what Matthew had in his Gospel. And the addition is important, and it's important for us today and for this message. Because it brings us beautifully to the second passage of Scripture I read. And you'll see in that, which was Matthew 26, 36 to 46. And you'll see in that passage that Jesus is again under attack, he's under assault, he's under pressure. In the garden of Gethsemane. And this time the devil comes against him, not as the Son of God. But he comes at him as the Son of Man. Now there's a difference here, and it's a difference that we need to understand. Jesus had to overcome as the Son of Man. Not as the Son of God. Because if he overcame as the Son of God then his sacrifice will be meaningless to you and me. Meaningless. He had to suffer. He had to endure testing and temptation like as any other man. And he had to overcome as the Son of Man. Here the enemy of God comes not to challenge who he is, but what he is. What he is. We know he is the Son of God because he is of God, the only begotten of the Father. We've already said that. But he comes against him for what he is the perfect sacrifice, the Lamb of God, the only one who could possibly pay the price for our sin, the spotless Lamb of God, the sinless. Lamb of God. Jesus had proved in the first passage that he was indeed the Son of God, hadn't he? He defeated the devil with the Word of God. The devil tried to use the Word of God against him. And Jesus brought against that the truth of the Word of God. You know, the devil always uses a little sliver of truth and wraps a lie around it. That's why it's called deception. If it was a blatant lie, you'd see right through it, wouldn't you? But Jesus Jesus had proved that he was indeed the Son of God. However, he was also God incarnate. Incarnate. Incarnate means that he was God, yet in human form. doesn't mean that there was just a spirit about him. He was created by the Father in the womb of Mary. But he was born every inch a man. With emotions, with anxieties, fears. That had to be overcome. Because in overcoming those things, he related to us. In truth. God in human form. He had made... He had had a human body which was susceptible to everything our body is. Illness, injury, and so on. And that includes the emotions and fears. If it were not, as I've said before, his sacrifice would be meaningless for us. Which testing or temptation do you think was the most difficult for him to go through? I'm going to ask you, think about it. Which do you think was the hardest, the most difficult for Jesus to go through? The testing as the Son of God or testing as the Son of Man? Answers on a piece of paper after the message. No. I want to put it to you today that it was the second. His testing, his trial as the Son of Man. Because he had to overcome what we have to overcome. He had to overcome the fears and everything else. 
The trial he had to undergo in the garden was by far the greatest trial. It was here, and I've listed a few things, it was here as the Son of Man that he faced the ultimate test. The ultimate test. And I want you to think on these things seriously. It would mean the humility of being arrested before all Jerusalem at Passover. I want you to bear in mind that Jerusalem at this time would be packed to overflowing. Any of you that have ever been to Jerusalem will know what a small place it is. Much smaller than it is now. And it would have been packed with upwards of a million people from all corners of the known world, there for Passover. Filled with priests, filled with Levites, filled with the obedience to the word. And Jesus would have to suffer the humility of being arrested and brought through the streets on such a day. And yes, it would mean being physically abused by soldiers and the authorities. And yes, it would mean being separated from his disciples and standing alone. And yes, it would mean taking upon himself all, and underline all, our sin, pain, sickness, infirmity, disease and sorrow, past, present and future, until he comes again. And yes, it would mean being herded through the streets after being sorely whipped and beaten. Carrying a wooden cross at least part of the way. And hanging there naked on the main thoroughfare of Jerusalem for all to see. Scripture says he was naked and he was naked. All of this would be too much for any ordinary man to bear, wouldn't it? Any of it would be more than any other man could bear. However, this is not why, I don't believe, why his stress was so great in the garden. He knew all these things were coming to pass. That's why he came. He came to pay the price. He knew why he was coming. He knew what was ahead and he knew that he would have to be nailed to a cross and give up his sinless life for you and for me. He knew all that. But why, what do you think could have caused him such stress, stress such anxiety of spirit that caused him to sweat drops of blood? Literally. Literally. I want to put this to you. I believe the cause of that stress was the fear of being separated from his heavenly father. Something that had not happened in all eternity. Separated by blackness and darkness. That's what caused him the stress. And there was great anxiety there, but that had to be overcome so that it could be that perfect sacrifice. It was as the Son of Man that Jesus satisfied the great wrath of God that was hanging over every man, woman and child on the face of this earth. Son of Man. Son of Man. Now let's look at Son of God and Son of Man. Those were the testings. They were both pretty bad. First one was bad enough. He'd been fasting for 40 days. Think you'd be tempted to eat some bread if you could make stone bread? I think we all would after 40 days. But the second point, son of God, son of man. Let's look at this. It was as the son of God, the only begotten of the Father, I've already said that, that Jesus came into this world. We're all agreed on that, aren't we? But it was as the Son of Man that he went to the cross. 
It had to be the Son of Man that went to the cross. It was also the Son of Man that rose victoriously from the dead. It was. Which means that you have risen from the dead with him. Because he rose as the Son of Man. That he now sits at the right hand of the Father in heaven as the Son of Man. Isn't that great to know that now there is a man sitting at the right hand of God? But he's not just a man. He's a God-man. God in the flesh. And that's what you are being created into. God-men. God-women. God-people. A people of God. Brothers and sisters of the Lord Jesus Christ, when we are made one with him. It's interesting to me, and I hope to you as well, that the last time that Jesus is referred to, this is where it gets good, by the way, it gets interesting. The last time that Jesus was referred to as the Son of God is in Revelation 2, verse 18. And let me read it to you. Unto the angel of the church in Thyatira, write, These things saith the Son of God, who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. That's the last time that I can find in Scripture that Jesus is addressed as the Son of God. Now where do you think the last time it is in scripture where he is addressed as the son of man? I'm going to tell you. It's Revelation 14 verse 14. Just a few chapters on from where we read the last one. Revelation 14 verse 14. And I looked and behold a white cloud and upon that cloud one sat like unto the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. You know what that signifies? It's the gathering of the saints. And he comes not as the Son of God, but he comes as the Son of Man. King of kings, Lord of Lords, but Son of Man is our Saviour. Yes, it was the Son of God, that, as the Son of God that Jesus came into the world, but it's as the Son of Man that he will return for his bride, for you and for me. If, only, if we only see Jesus as the Son of God, we miss the real reality of who he truly is and what he really means to us as individuals. Son of God is, is aloof from us. He hasn't yet related to us. He hasn't yet been tested in every way as any other man and hasn't been tried to the ultimate sacrifice as a man. But once he had, glory be to the Son of Man. The Lord Jesus Christ. The Son of God, yes. But the Son of Man to me. And to you. Our Saviour. Our Redeemer. The Redeemer had to be a close kinsman. Didn't he? So is Jesus. Because he is Son of Man. He was tempted in every way, just as any other human being. In fact, Hebrews 4 says this, Hebrews 4, 15 and 16. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy 
and find grace to help in time of need. Isn't that good? Because there's a man in heaven, a God-man. We can come through him to Almighty God. Because Jesus is acquainted with our infirmities. He's acquainted with our griefs, with our sorrows. Because he overcame them himself. His life, death and resurrection were of a man. And because of that there is now a man, albeit, as I've said, a God-man seated at the right hand of Almighty God in heaven. Forever interceding on your behalf. He can do that because he is a man. He knows your every feeling, your every need, your every emotion, your feelings, your troubles, your anxieties, your fears. He knows because he experienced. However, when this God-man returns, very soon now, I believe, do you believe? When he returns very soon now, we will be changed to be as he is. We will be changed to be as he is. No longer battling with these fears and anxieties and troubles. We also will be overcomers because we will be as he is. Hallelujah. 1 John 3 verse 2 says this. Beloved, now are we the sons of God and it does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Hallelujah. Glory to his name. Everything that happens to us from the moment we submit to his authority, his lordship in our lives, is part of the process of making us to be as he is. I've said that many times over the last few weeks, but it's so true. Everything that happens to us, do you think anything happens to you by accident? By mere coincidence? Nothing happens outside of the knowledge of Almighty God. Nothing. Everything happens and it has its purpose and its part in his plan. But everything that happens to us is working together to that plan, that process to bring us to the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. Being an active part of the body of Christ or the, the church through fellowship is a vital part of this process. I want to read Ephesians 4. Verse 11 to 16. For he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teaching, teachers sorry, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Not for self-grandizement, not for promotion, but for the edification of the body of Christ until we all come to the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man. Man. Unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and the cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive, but speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things. We're all in the process of growing up into Christ. All of us, including me. From whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplies according to the effectual working in the measure of every part maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. It's all a process, brothers and sisters. It's 
It's all a process of making us as he is. And it's, it's important, especially as we approach the time of Passover, as I've said, it's on the 14th, which I believe is Tuesday, this coming week. Monday, sorry. Starts Monday, goes into Tuesday. Uh, it's important, especially as we approach that time, that we remember what Jesus did for us all. Because it was that Passover that Jesus fulfilled as the spotless Lamb of God. It doesn't mean we've all got to dress up like Jews. It doesn't mean we've all got to wear prayer shawls and keep our, read the Torah scroll on the day and all that kind of thing. But we remember what Jesus did for us. We celebrate what Jesus did for us. He was and is the spotless Lamb of God. And he gave himself as a man for you and for me. Son of man. He wants us to relate to him as the son of man. And this title of his is greatly emphasised through New Testament scripture. I'm only going to read a couple here. Romans 5 verse 15. Romans 5 verse 15 But not as the offence, so also is the free gift. For if through the offence of one many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift of grace which is by one man. Jesus Christ hath abounded unto many. Praise the Lord. 1 Timothy 2 verse 5 and 6 For there is one God One mediator between God and men. Who? The man. Christ Jesus. Who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. We're testifying of him today. Hallelujah. He's the son of God, but he's also the son of man. Hallelujah to the son of man. It's important for us to remember this because... As I read earlier, Jesus' greatest test was that of man, the Son of Man. Overcoming the fear and anxiety of being separated from the Heavenly Father. And he was literally separated by darkness. God could not look upon him, could not look upon him because of the sin that was on him now. God, who had created him in Mary's womb, had imbued his very essence into Mary, into this man, couldn't look upon him. And what must have that done in the heart of Jesus and the mind of Jesus as now the Son of Man? Praise be to God that he did overcome it. He did overcome it. Hallelujah. He sweat drops of blood in that garden. Three times he went to the Lord. Lord, if this cup, if it be willing that this cup pass from me, if there be some other way. But not my will be done. Your will be done. Jesus knew he had to be crucified. That didn't bother him. That's why he came. It was that separation from the Father that was tearing his heart and his mind. But praise God, he did overcome. And that it was as a man, he did overcome. As we remember and celebrate this season, let's all remember that if we have been convicted of our sin, if we've repented of our sin and submitted to the Lordship of Jesus, we have this overcomer abiding in us. Because that's what it means, brothers and sisters. And I want you to understand, this is what I want you to get from this message. This is what I believe the Lord was showing me, not physically, but showing me in my mind what he wanted to get over to us. That when 
Jesus talks about us receiving eternal life. It's knowing the Father, isn't it? Is eternal life. John 17. This is eternal life that man should know the Father. When we receive that eternal life, it's not a gift from God. It's the gift of God in you and in me. It's his gift of him through Jesus Christ. That's the reality. John 16, verse 33. Two more scriptures and then we're done. John 16, verse 33. These things I have spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. In the world you shall have, not might have, you shall have tribulation. You will have trouble. Anybody not have trouble? No. <laughs> A few smiles there. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. Why should we be of good cheer? Because he has overcome the world. And he now dwells in you. 1 John 4 verse 4 You are of God. You are of God. There, I've said it. You are of God. <laughs> if you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Saviour, you are of God. Little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is where? In you, than he that is in the world. Greater is he that is in you, than he that is in the world. So are you going to be afraid now when trials and tribulations come? Of course you are. But you can overcome them through Jesus Christ because he abides in you. You have God in you. Just as Jesus did. Isn't that amazing? That's what we're remembering at this season. God came to earth as a man. He lived as a man. He died as a man. He rose as a man. He overcame as a man. The son of man. For you. And now that son of man abides in you. So when you come to celebrate with your family, whether it's an Easter gathering or whether it's Remembering Passover, remember what it means. Jesus, the spotless Lamb of God, the man, gave himself willingly for you. Suffered all that he had to suffer and was separated from his Heavenly Father for you. And for me. And overcame to do it as the Son of Man. So then when we encounter troubles, when we experience hardships, let's remember that we do not come to a God who is detached from man. We have a man at the right hand of God Almighty, the Everlasting Father, who forever intercedes for you and for me. May God richly bless each and every one of you this season, whether you celebrate and remember Passover or whether it's with your family at Easter. Remember what it means and remember what it means for you. God bless you.